Words of Joy and Hope, Solemnity of All Saints, Matthew 5, 1-12. And the commentary is by Father Fernando Armelini. A good feast day for everyone. In the past, saints enjoyed a lot of popularity. Churches were full of their statues, and people resorted more to them than to God. We had the saint of the drivers, saint of students, the saints who helped to find the lost objects, saints to heal the eyes, saints for all sorts of evils. They were considered a kind of intermediaries, and they had the function of to cushion the impact in front of a God who was considered a little distant, too big and unreachable, and also a God a little strange to our problems. On the other hand, the saints had lived in our world. They had experienced our same difficulties, and we prayed to them thinking that maybe they understood better our problems. And then they would present our petitions to God. I remember that when I was a child and there was no rain in the fields, people did not pray to God, but they went to the cemetery to ask for the help of those who had lived by our side and who now, being close to God, could intercede on our behalf. Deep down, it was a beautiful thing. But today, the tendency to go to the saints to ask them to present our petition to God is diminishing. The one who prays has understood that in reality, to pray means to pray as Jesus prayed. It means to go directly to the Father to present our situation and receive from Him the light to live as He wants us to live. Therefore, saints, including Mary, are considered justly brothers and sisters who show us their way, show us with their lives a way to follow Christ. And they invite us to pray at all times, together with them, to the only Father, not through them, but praying with them to the only Father in heaven to receive as they have received that light that allows them to walk well in life. It is also important that we abandon the idea that there are two churches, one in heaven and another here on earth. One of the living and one of the dead. No, the church is one. The family of God is one because God is the God of the living, not of the dead. We must eliminate this conception because we have the living that is us who are still in gestation. And then we are reborn without dying, said Jesus, to the definitive life. This is our human condition and it cannot be otherwise. We must be born twice to arrive at a complete and definite life. The one who receives the Beatitudes of Jesus and decides to live as the blessed man embodied by Jesus belongs to the kingdom of the saints. There is no distinction between a saint of this earth and those of heaven. In the glory to God, in the Mass, we sing, You alone are holy. If we join this the proposal of life that Jesus offers us. We participate in this sanctity already on this earth. Therefore, today is the feast of our family, of all the saints, of all the living who are in gestation or those who are already in heaven. Keep in mind, therefore, that this word saints was used in the early church to speak of the disciples of Christ. It was the others who called them uh, Christians, and it was uh, this dameful word, which we later took as distinctive. 
But the primitive Christians, those of the primitive church, were called among themselves brothers, sisters, the believers, the disciples of the Lord, the perfect ones, also the ones on the road, and finally, the saints. When Paul writes his letter, he sends them to all the saints who are in Philippi, to the saints who are in Ephesus, to the saints, to the brothers of Christ who are in Colossae. Thus, all letters are addressed to the saints of a community, and for saints it is not understood those who are already in paradise, but all the saints who have joined Christ. In today's Gospel, we read the Beatitudes of Jesus. To call a person happy means to congratulate him or her. It means to recognize that he or she is a successful person. What do we understand when we say to someone, you are happy, happy you? We say that one is happy when he has many possessions, goods of this world, money, cars. We say, what a happy person you are. This is the criterion of happiness that is frequent among people, and we ask ourselves, does Jesus call these people happy, blessed in this sense? Is this the happy person proposal that Jesus makes? This is where faith in Christ is played. He makes us a proposal of happiness and asks us to play our lives, to spend our lives, to receive congratulations from Him. Happy you! Congratulations! You guessed right in your life. You are a successful person. For people who react according to the criteria of this world, the happy person does not correspond to what Jesus of Nazareth proposes. It is exactly the opposite. Then, we must ask ourselves, on what proposal of happiness do I want to risk my life? From whom do I want to receive the congratulation that says, Happy you, from those who follow the criteria of this world, or that at the end of my life Christ reaches out to me and says, You are happy, you did well. Origen, a great biblist, biblical person from the of the second and third century, said that the Beatitudes were the image, the description of the person of Jesus. They are the image of this spiritual figure who is Jesus of Nazareth. At my back you see two icons. They are two blessed people. One, the blessed, that is Jesus of Nazareth, he who has given his life, who returned to the house of the Father as the blessed one. Happy you, you are a successful man. Then a blessed one, Mary, who was proclaimed blessed by Elizabeth. Blessed are you who believed. She is the sister of all those who leave her trust in the proposal of happiness made by Jesus. Let us stop now to listen to the proposal of happiness that Jesus makes us. Being able to internalize the Beatitudes of Jesus requires silence, a path of inner purification, a long and deep meditation because willingly or un unintentionally, we internalize the Beatitudes that circulate in the world and we are always tempted to follow them. Let us listen to what Jesus proposes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. 
and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be happy because the reward that awaits you in heaven is abundant. Many rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. Rejoice and be happy because the reward awaits you in, in heaven is abundant. Many are the interpretation, interpretation that were given to these Beatitudes. Some say that a person is blessed having accumulated many assets, although it does not have the heart tied to these goods and gives the alms. Therefore, this beatitude would be uh, the rich people who are also interested in others and that the bad guys are those uh, like the rich man of the parable that only think about themselves. And there is a tradition of the church that justifies this conception. Keep in mind that Adam's giving is not the solution presented by the new world and may even serve to mask theft. To what kind of poor people that Jesus referred to? Of those who have nothing, who, have, who live without possessing anything, and to whom that Jesus proclaimed blessed? Who is Jesus referring to? He's referring, is he referring to beggars, the disinherited, the illiterate? If these were the blessed ones, then we should all be like, like them. It would be absurd that Jesus would make this proposal of happiness. So to whom is Jesus referring? He is not talking about the beggars of Capernaum, to those who are by the road. It is not that he says to the poor beggar, happy of you, I hope that all were like you. No. This is absurd, misleading interpretation, contrary to the whole gospel. Jesus is addressing the disciples, those who have accepted his proposal as a person who became poor by choice. The ideal of the Christian is not misery, it is love. It is the community that accepts the proposal of Jesus and therefore no one should be poor because God has created the world well. Everything is yours. The goods are abundant. All the necessities of life of his sons and daughters must be satisfied because he has prepared the world well. What is to be done so that nobody be poor, so that everyone has what it takes to have a decent life? Let everyone become poor. That is, they should remain without anything to donate everything they have out of love. Therefore, it is love that introduces one into the kingdom of God. And in this kingdom enter all those who remain poor, those who are poor in spirit, that is, moved by the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit is the inner strength, the divine life, the life of Jesus of Nazareth that has been donated. 
This leads to remain with nothing so that when we see someone who has need of us, we are able to share all that the Lord has placed in our hands. The person who donates everything and at the end of his life is presented to God without anything that belongs to him because he has given everything, this is blessed. The promise is, you are within the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, when we cling to anything for our selfishness, when we fault about ourselves, at that time we are not within the kingdom of God. But instead, when we are interested in the brother or sister, and we share everything so that their needs be resolved, then we are in the new world then we are in the kingdom of God. When we have nothing because we have given everything, Christ extends his hand and tells us, you are blessed. This is very different of the beatitude of those who are in the world. And the world says, happy of you because you have more than what you need. They are two opposite beatitudes, and it is up to us to make the option and know from whom we want to receive the congratulations. Second beatitude, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus is not talking about any pain or affliction. We had a kind of sorrowful spirituality in the past, as if um, God would be pleased with our pain, where we should offer our pain to God. No. The affliction of the blessed is something else. It is the one who lives with passion the effort to build a world according to God's design, a world of justice, of peace, of love, of reconciliation, of fraternity. And what does the person who wants to build this world see? What is the reality of the world? war, violence, injustice, hypocrisy, pressure, falsehood, a world where it seems that God has been excluded from uh, human coexistence, and that is guided by values that are not those of the gospel. What does the disciple do in front of this world? He cannot be happy. We are very far from the world loved by God. And the authentic disciple suffers, grieves over this situation. This is the blessed one. He's the one who proves this pain, this anguish, which is the heart of God, to build a new world and suffer in front of the world where he is now. Sadness is not born from the fact that he is wrong, but the things in the world that are wrong. The temptation now is to lose interest, to let your arms fall. If the evil one convinces you that the new world is a dream, the ancient world will continue. The promise that they will be comforted, it means that God is on the side of those who feel this deep suffering facing a world that is not God's. They will be comforted, means that God is on their side, and together with him, the new world will be built. Third beatitude, happy are the dispossessed, the meek, because they will inherit the earth. The adjective meek brings to mind the image of a calm, shy person who does not react to provocations, those who accept injustice peacefully without lamenting, are those people the, who shun all forms of conflict with a slightly weak personality, the ones that are proclaimed blessed. We have the image of these dispossessed who are blessed and uh, that uh, we find it in Psalm 37, which is the psalm where surely Jesus has taken this beatitude from. Meek is the person who must endure even oppression, abuses, 
but that does not yield to the temptation to react with violence. Psalm 37 says, Restrain anger, repress anger, do not be angry, it will be worse. 37, 8. It is not an invitation to resignation, but an invitation to hope. Jesus applied to himself this word, meek. Learn from me that I am meek and humble of heart. Matthew 11, 29. Jesus experienced dramatic conflicts, but he has confronted them with the disposition of the heart that characterizes the meek. What Psalm 37 says, Meek is the righteous person who, when he has to face situations of abuse, he does not attack, but he insists on establishing in the world the justice of God, the justice of the new world. What is the promise made to these people who commit themselves but do not give in to the temptation to build a new world with violence? They shall inherit the earth. Not heaven, the earth. This is where this world will be built. They are people who will believe we will behave completely different from the violent ones, the arrogant, those who spread a hedonistic culture. They will be those who will introduce in this world the design of God. The fourth beatitude, happy are those who hunger and thirst for justice. It is not about distributed justice, that of which we speak and uh, that we regulate human relations to each his own. And it is even less that justice that wants to see someone executed because he has committed a crime. Justice that is done when one is sent to jail. These are justices that refer to human res relationships. Here we talk about Jesus, about hunger and thirst for the justice of God. What is the justice of God about? It is the design of love that God wants to be realized in this world. Whoever realizes the justice of God in the world, the project that he has on this world, is a blessed person. The justice of God is the one that wants people to feel united, that they live in communion, that they share the goods, that they live as their own the pain and the needs of the brother and sisters, those who are able to forgive, to change the enemies into brothers and sisters. This is the justice that God wants to be fulfilled in this world. Blessed is he who longs for this justice and wants it to come true. It is like the craving of one who in the desert is eagerly looking for a search of water, like the hungry who needs food. These are the primary desires. This beatitude is addressed to those who find within themselves this passion for construction of God's design on earth. Fifth beatitude, happy are the merciful, because they will be treated with mercy. The most immediate interpretation is that when one finds himself faced with the dilemma of being magnanimous or follow the desire to make him pay to someone who has done us wrong, and uh, in this case, in this sense, merciful is uh, he who makes compassion and forgiveness prevail, the one who is benevolent. But if we identify mercy with compassion, we do not understand how God can be merciful if he has also to apply justice as we un understand it, that is, punish the sinner. You cannot close your eyes to crime or be merciful only with the little sins. This interpretation of mercy 
always had difficulty, even with the rabbis, who could not agree on the mercy of God with his justice. That is, a need to make people pay to those who had transgressed his commandments. Hesed, the merciful in the Bible, Hesed, is the faithful and unconditional love of God. God is merciful because no sin, no transgression of ours, will succeed in separating him from the, this passion of love that uh, leads him to do good and only good to people. The word merciful does not correspond to the idea of this passion of unconditional love that God has for us, a love that manifests itself in three moments. The first is the realization that the other has a need. He is not insensitive. His gaze is attentive to the brother's need. He does not seek to be distracted and worried that he is well without caring about others. He's sensitive. Second moment. To offer compassion. It is the literal meaning of the word with passion, compassion. Suffers next to the one who has a need. A verb that uh, we know very well is splankenitse, to feel touching the most intimate. It is the passion that shows God the needs of people. third moment of those who are merciful. After having seen the need, after feeling sorry, having felt the pain of the other person as his own, comes the concrete intervention. This is a merciful person. The promise to these merciful people, you will find mercy. What does this promise mean? they will be in tune with the heart of God. Core of God that is merciful, that is, it is unconditional love, even for those who do evil. The merciful one who is in tune with the heart of God loves unconditionally even the enemies. The sixth beatitude, happy are the pure in heart because they will see God. The heart is the seed, not so much of feeling, but of decisions, of options. In the Semitic conception, everything starts from the heart. It was the heart that gave the orders. If the heart is pure, certain options are made, but it is not pure. The options are problematic. What do we mean by pure? Pure gold means that there is only gold, not with other me materials, metals, there is no man. Pure coffee is just coffee, it does not have chicory. Pure heart is the one where only God is. There are no idols, idols, and therefore the choices are made according to God. This is what it means to see God, make the experience of God. This experience cannot be done by those who do not have a pure heart. What is meant by a heart that is not pure? There is God in that heart, but there is also money. When one makes a, the choice, one decides on a function, sometimes according to what God suggests, and other times what money tells you, money or pride or concupiscence or moral perversion. These idols also influence the heart that is confused, a contaminated heart. Those who do not have a pure heart do not see God anymore because the idols end up obstructing, obfuscating the face of the Lord. Seven Beatitude. Happy those who work for peace. The builders of peace, not the peaceful one, as it was said before, following the old Latin translation. That is, those who do not hurt anyone, who are 
peaceful people. No, here we talk about peace builders, Eirene and Poyein. Peace and do, build. Therefore, it's not about quiet people, but of those who are committed, who act, who put their hands to the work to build a world of peace. The peacemaker par excellence is Jesus of Nazareth. We remember what the wonderful text from the letter to the Ephesians says. Christ is our peace, that of two peoples, the Jews and the pagans, made only one, knocking down with his body the dividing wall that was in the middle and restoring peace to reconcile the two with God in one body. Ephesians 2, 14, 15. But the biblical peace is not only the lack of conflict, it is the order according to the justice of God that is committed so that all live well in the world, that there is joy for all. That person is a peace builder, the one that creates political, economic, and cultural conditions that favor growth of people, is a builder of peace. They will be called children of God. It is the most beautiful promise. It is a divine passive. It should not be translated as God will consider them his children. In the Semitic sense, Son is the one who resembles the Father. Thus, those who build a world of love and peace, God looks at them and says, You are my children. Eighth Beatitude Happy are those persecuted for the sake of good. Actually, it's not a new Beatitude, but a summary of all the previous ones. If you accept this proposal of man that Jesus makes you, you come into conflict with the proposal of man that the world proposes you. And the ancient world does not resign itself to give in peacefully, but it wants to perpetuate itself. Those who give their adhesion to the new man that Jesus proposes have to pay a price they will have to confront those who want to remain united to the ancient world, to the old man, to the ones who withdraw on their own interest, therefore accumulate assets, etc. What promise do they have? It is the one mentioned in the first beatitude, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When the old world come into conflict with the new life that you want to live, following the beatitude of Jesus, and the old world persecutes you, it is the sign that you are inside the new world. I wish everyone a good feast and a good continuation of this week. Excellent.